we have people in the waiting room. I'm going to admit them all. Hey. They're all joining now. Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Ernesto Lasso de la Vega. I will wait a few more minutes because we'll start. Well, it's right now 11 a.m. We have um, a webinar today. It's a web plan webinar that we're planning on doing every month. We have been doing it every first Wednesday of every month. And this is a, a collaboration. In fact, um, we are usually have the host of Karen Miller, but she last second, <laughs> just their, web, their website, their internet dropped. So I'm picking up. I'm also going to be the speaker for today. I have a, a little introduction and a little bit of a house cleaning, house cleaning, house, <laughs> house housekeeping rules that we're going to be presenting um, for our webinar. So it's Welcome to Wet Plan. This is a watershed education and training ponds, lakes, and neighborhood. This is an initiative that we have put together, several organizations here in Lee County. You can five, find our website, uh, which I'm trying to open here. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> we put together uh, this, this group. Oh, Karen is here. So we have Karen. <laughs> So Karen, I'm already presenting this, but um, you can definitely join in as soon as you get your microphone on. So a conglomerate of uh, different organizations, we have the um, private sector with Johnson Engineering, G G C G H D, uh, Lee County Division of Natural Resources, Florida Native Plant Society is present, and uh, also Pond Watch with the Lee County Highest and Control District. So again, this is a conglomerate of uh, organizations who would like to learn to teach and to actually uh, uh, present this kind of uh, information about stormwater ponds. So a little bit of housekeeping here. If you want to ask a question, you can definitely click the chat and write your information there um, first, because then we'll know who you are and also what is your uh, email if you want to get more information about this activity that we're doing. So please write your email there so we can write it and then put it in, your, in our mailing list. Also, if you wanna ask a question, click the chat and you can write there. And another one of our members are gonna be reading the chat to look at the picture uh, at those questions and try to answer them. Another thing that we have, please unmute, I mean, unmute, mute yourself so we can utilize the source, the internet in a better way so we have enough bandwidth that we can present, uh, including the videos because that kind of a limit their speed on our presentations. Um, I think I think I, that's all what I have for the housekeeping. So I'm gonna stop the sharing here and I'm gonna move on into our presentation. Now, um, a little bit of background, and let me present myself with the sharing. You can also have, um, well, we'll see how it goes into this. Um, at the end, we'll also we'll present a little more about the other activities that we're doing with in wet plan, which is a whole series of activities, not only the next presentation we have next month, but also there is a contest for the best pond, and we'll be sharing that with you all. So let me move on right into the presentation I have created. This is called Algae Bloom. And first, let me give you a little bit of background on myself. I'm a Pond Watch coordinator for the Lee County Highest and Control District. I've been working almost more than 30 years now. Wow, 30 years of service in Lee County. With this program has been phenomenal because we have learned a lot. And I wanna share with you a lot of the pictures I got here are from homeowners who have taken pictures and I'm sharing them with you all and then experiences that we are going to be doing. And I'm focusing on algae blooms and I'm not gonna make it so complicated with a lot of technical information, but a lot more practical information. I hope you guys enjoy this. So moving on, uh, the agenda for this presentation is that we're gonna explain a little bit about what an algae bloom is, what causes an algae bloom, 
Later on, we're going to go into not all algae blooms are bad. So we're going to talk about the good algae bloom. I mean, good algae, the bad algae, because there are some bad ones. And then the uh, what is an ugly one, the ugly one, but it's not an algae. So we're all presenting these different modalities of algae. So first, the algae bloom is a rapid increase or accumulation of population of algae, which is monotypic usually in freshwater or marine systems recognized by the discoloration of the water from their pigments. And in this case, you probably were familiar with ponds that has algae bloom like this one has filamentous algae. There's some blue-green algae ponds that you have seen, and this is a type of algae that is growing. We're going to talk about this. This red one here is another type of algae. It's not red tie, but it's another type of algae that is also uh, producing a bloom. We'll talk about that. This is another type of algae. It's called Cara, but it's a microscopic, so you can see it. And it's, we'll talk about that as well. And it's actually um, a nice plant that I have very good words to say about this plant. And of course, it can produce algae problems like fish kills and anoxia and the scum that you see there, very unpleasant. So we'll talk in, in all this regard. But moving on with the agenda, I have a, what causes an algae bloom? And that is a, an interesting fact. I have brought here a slide, a graph from a pond watch uh, member, one of our pond 63, I'm gonna point name, names, but we have the, the year 2018 came up with a nice explanation about what an algae bloom happened here. It happens because the water is stagnant and there's nutrients accumulating. So once you have this condition, also the rain might bring nutrients, the temperatures are warm and the sunlight. If you see in the graphic here, the bars that you see in light blue, there are rain in inches. And so there, in April, to May, there was a rain events that are coming in. And as you can see, the nutrients increase. Their orange nutrients is nitrogen, total nitrogen has increased. And then the phosphorus also has a little in blue here has increased. Therefore, the green blue, um, the green line has shown the algae in the form of chlorophyll A, which is the pigment in the algae. And it's a spike absolutely caused by this presence of nutrients. And the ratio of nitrogen phosphorus here is being respected. You have 10 nitrogen per every one phosphorus. That's a excellent ratio for the algae to occur. As the rain went down, there also the nutrients went down and the algae, and it comes up again when you have another spike of rain. So rain dictates, and again, rain temperatures and the light is definitely part of that. But then in the winter, down the rain is going down, the temperatures are also cooling off, and then you don't have so much of those nutrients present there. So that is basically the main reason for why this algae occurs in the summer and which when we have in most of them. Um, this is uh, talking about chlorophyll A. I actually like to present a little bit of how you measure chlorophyll A. And, and I have made this video for the college and I will play it because it has its own sound. And stormwater ponds are being built to collect the water that runs out from the roof from the root, from the road, and they're being carrying some of the nutrients. And these nutrients are the ones who stimulate the microscopic algae. So the sample we took this is from the pond and we have the sample. We, we Now we need to extract the algae, the chlorophyll from the algae. But in order to do that, we have to filter this water and we're gonna use this filter system. This is the funnel where I'm gonna be putting a filter, the membrane filter. It's very small filter. This is it's a small as 0.65 micrometers. This can filter bacteria, algae. So we'll be trapping this filter. Allow me to do that. We take about 100 milliliters of the sample and we're going to be placing in this graduated cylinder. There, approximately 100 milliliters. Perfect. So we put them in this container. And we're going to be filtering with the help of a pump that creates a vacuum. And it's going to suck all the liquid through the membrane. Now, all the green area that you see there is algae. So we can take this sample. And what I do is I put it folded 
in this container that now is going to be a little graduated um, test tube with a cap. We're going to put acetone because the acetone is the this uh, is a solvent that it can take and extract from every cell of the algae. It will extract the chlorophyll. So I take 10 milliliters out of the acetone, 90% acetone, and I'll take that and I will place it into this container. There, exactly nine, nine, 10 milliliters of acetone, place it in this in, in the filter. And this filter has the capacity, the, the great advantage that this filter will dissolve with the acetone. So, uh, oh, uh, will dissolve, and this is a vortex, it's an agitator that can actually mix and it will take all that filter, dissolve it. Just take a few seconds, not even a minute. There, take a look. Oh, there's a few tiny little particles there. But you can see all the cell, the, uh, the chlorophyll has been extracted. So it might be some few cells there swimming. Usually we take these cells and we put this in the refrigerator 24 hours to make guarantee all the extraction has happened. But once we have the whole extraction happen, then come on. We put it in this spectral photometer. This spectral photometer has the ability to record different wavelengths of the the excitation that the light, as the light going through this, this will be able to read and then take us um, an absorbance or transmittance. And depending on that, we can tell the concentration of chlorophyll. And that is the final result that we're going to express to the quality of the water. When you have a lot of algae, it's going to be really, really green. Very little algae in the pond, you will have very light, light amount of chlorophyll. So this is a great indicator that tells us how much chlorophyll, how much algae exists in the pond. All right. Wow, it's so weird to see myself talking. <laughs> I want to correct him when he makes some mistakes. I want to just tell him, no, too late. Oh, well, it's recorded. Well, the message here with this chlorophyll A is that uh, you might not, uh, the chlorophyll A might not indicate that, that your pond is having an algae bloom. And why is because you have some algae blooms where in this case at Cara is the water is super clear. So there is no suspended algae in here. Same as this, some filamentous algae will show up that the water is super clear. So you don't have the algae suspended in the water column. Whereas these other ponds on the right, you see there is definitely suspended algae in the water column. Same as this one here that you see the turtle, half of the turtle, the bottom half is pretty much turbid by the algae suspended and this will show definitely an algae bloom with the chlorophyll pigments very high where these ones on the left will not have that kind of a same characteristic so chlorophyll is not always an indicator of an algae bloom depending on what type of algae you have present in the pond now along with that i had another video i'm sorry i'm just showing videos but i thought they're kind of cute I use this one at the college and I want to use it also on your in your in this presentation because this is a stormwater pond right at the Edison. It used to be Edison Community College. Now it's South uh, Florida Southwestern University State College. Um, so this is a stormwater pond is the drainage and you'll see some littoral plants, nice, beautiful littoral shelving around this pond with pickerel weed. It's a nice littoral plant. You see bees going in there. The flowers are gorgeous. And, and this is kind of like a typical storm water retention pond. Now, now you have some of the algae blooms there. There's filamentous algae. And this is typical of most storm water ponds. You have this scum, this floating filamentous algae. And I wanted to take a camera. And what I did is I took the camera. I'm showing you underwater. What does this look like? I mean, is this is a, a clear close up of the, of the scum of the filamentous algae and you see all that filamentous going around there well it, and along with that they are associated with the littorals those pickerel weeds that you see there all this fil filamentous algae is growing in between and sometimes even attached to the stems 
that the plants are standing on the water and the stems are covered with some of these filamentous algae. Now, most people think that this, the plants are removing the nutrients, but not from the water column. This, the, this filamentous algae is what is removing the nutrients from the water column. So the plants are using as a support for this filamentous algae, and that filamentous is the one who is doing the, the removal. And those are ducks, in case that you don't know, but these are ducks. And the ducks play a role on this pond. Um, I took a little bit, a pinch of this filamentous algae and I put it in a slide just to show the type of organisms that live in there. And in fact, this one here is a cladocera. This actually is a, micro, is a oh, crustacea that is filtering water. There are millions of these guys in this whole filamentous algae. This is only one guy and he's constantly filtering and he does and he did poop. <laughs> I show this video all the time. And when they see the poop, it's just a laugh. Anyway, they, they, there's some our organisms are filtering the, the algae there. Uh, this filamentous algae has these spores and this, all their spores are also present in this whole uh, filamentous. And they, again, they're growing, they're taking nutrients as they're growing. And it's, it's all part of the biology on this pond. There's other big, larger animals like these nematodes. And this guy is just wandering around, just minding his own business. I happen to happen in the, in the slide and I wanted to show you, I wanted to show you more stuff. I'm a, such a geek. I don't know, I'm a biology geek. And I wanted to show the heart of this guy because this microscope that we had, had a great resolution and great. And you can see this guy is, of course, he's an animal. It's a worm, it's a nematode. And there's the heart that is pumping his heart away. And I just wanted to show you the heart because he has a heart. Oh my goodness. Now, other organisms like Rotherfurs, which are present in that mess and they're filtering back, by the way, these are Rotherfurs, the little black dots that you see swimming around, those are bacteria. That's another euglena there. But these are Rotherfurs that are filtering water. Again, there's all kinds of organisms that live in this tiny little pinch of slidey, and there's an oglina there, and which is another protista, and there's the, the nematode behind as a monster going to eat them. So anyway, all this life exists on that tiny little plant. So what is good algae? Well, algae is good as long as it stays under control, and that's what I wanted to get the message here. Maintains the good dissolved oxygen in the water for aquatic organisms. Algae is base is the base of the food pyramid. All these creatures that you saw, including the ducks, they live out of this, or this food. Uh, removes nutrients from the water column, yes. And the algae can attenuate sometimes the light reducing the growth of submerged plants. And sometimes they like that because then you don't have some other submerged plants growing excessively when you have this light attenuation. And this video here that I have is to show a nice pond with all these components, you see fish there, the gambusi are grazing, having a great time, the cara is there, some periphyton growing on the surrounding of the plant. And then you have the plants on top. So this is what the typical scenario of the Everglades, like Dr. Serge Thomas would like to see this. And this is the good algae. This is the great system of Southwest Florida, shallow ponds with all this kind of, um, yeah, data. And I'm, I took a little sample of that and then just to show some of the internal information. But along with all this information that I provided, I wanted to show this. Ducks are also large animals. They are like animals like fish and dogs and all these creatures, they, they get the support for food and their guys are having a blast here on this pond because they have the opportunity to eat and all those bugs that you saw associated in that filamentous algae, they are food for them. And that, that's the beauty of this. This is a well-balanced ecosystem that I want to express. Now, there are different types of algae and no matter where you have, algae is always gonna grow, green stuff is always gonna grow. In this case, it's planktonic algae. It's the pond that has the turtle that is turbid. These are microscopic algae that are suspended in the water column. 
and you can see them floating around. And this chlorophyll analysis can detect this type of, but this is one of the type, they might be bad when it goes into excess because the oxygen will be dropping in this huge concentrations of algae. And I want to just present this type of algae. There are other type of algae, like filamentous algae, like the ones that I was showing earlier. And if this one is called particularly spirogyra. And I thought it was kind of cute because the, cy the cytoplasma has this shape of a spirals. And that's the reason why it's called spirogyra. And in fact, I think it is a jazz group that's called spirogyra as well. Of course, I have my video here and I wanted to show you how does a scum, <laughs> the filamentous algae spirogyra look like in there. Um, the, the other characteristic is that when you pick it up with two fingers, it's very slimy, slimy as in like mucousy kind of, and that will be spirogyra. Whereas this other plant is called cladophora, not to confuse with cladocera, which is the bug. This cladophora, <laughs> it's uh, actually quite hairy. You, you will pick it up and you will feel like more like a rough kind of hair. And it is another type of filamentous algae. Again, nutrient removal forms these mats, and it can go pretty bad if it's in excess. Um, this is Cara, which is an excellent plant. It grows sometimes out of control, I have to admit, but it is a great filtration. It's a great, let's see if this video works this time. No, I had a hard time with this one. But anyway. It's, it's one of those plants that I really have to say good words about this plant because it is an excellent algae to control nutrients and to make the water clear the way we most people want to see it. Now, the bad ones. Here's some bad boys. Why they're bad? Because they produce toxins sometimes. So they produce unpleasant odors, asphyxiates the pond, takes the oxygen out of that, makes it anaerobic. And they kill some fish and sometimes some mammals. I mean, you don't want any uh, animal swimming. You, know, you don't want to swim there. That's kind of a really bad. There's some cases where you've seen a lot of these blue greens, and these are blue green algae. And blue green algae that could be different types. I had two examples here, which I'll talk about them briefly. But I wanted to bring the attention to this. Uh, this website has an excellent chart with different type of blue greens. And I wanted just to present this as I give credit to this website. Um, this chart that they present has all the different type of blue greens. And I'm not going to go into details of that, but they have different characteristics. Some of them are filamentous, some of them are single cell. But one of the interesting facts of blue greens is that this little sphere that you see in some of them are, is called an heterocyst. And heterocysts are able to absorb nutrients, I mean, nitrogen from the atmosphere and they can incorporate the nitrogen. So they don't really need so much the fertilizer, nitrogen coming from, they can grab their own nitrogen. And that's the, the, the scary part of blue greens. They do not depend on nitrogen presence. They might depend on some other nutrients that has to be there and then they, if they, get their own nitrogen, they can grow in excessive conditions, but not limited by nitrogen. Not all of them do that. Some of them do, and there's some of them are filamentous. So let me go into the two main problematic ones. By the way, and just to mention a few, there is some here that is Lingvia, and you probably heard about Lingvia. There's, um, there's, um, Anabinas and some other. And by the way, they're changing the names of these guys sometimes. It is really an, uh, a serious uh, scientific chore to name and to identify these things because they are tiny little characteristics that makes the difference between one and the other blue greens. And again, these are blue green. These are my serious, serious problems in Southwest Florida. Microcystis aeruginosa, one of the most troublesome algae that are blue greens because um, not only make these kind of huge messes, in fact, you can see they take those little blobs in the microscope that look like conglomerates of algae present in a mucousy kind of a con, um, yeah, kind of characteristic. They are producing microcystin toxins. So they are producing toxins that are very nasty. In fact, some 
there have been many cases of health related issues with this. You can cough as you go into these kind of ponds. Um, they produce this smell that it looks, smells like dirt. They call it geosmin, and that's a typical characteristic of this microcystis produces this smell. It's like taking dirt and you smell it in your hands. That's, that's the geosmin. Kill fish, kill mammals. There is a, an alternative for controlling that, and I'm presenting here a little video, a drone shot that we have on this particular case that they're using alum as a treatment. And the alum is a salt of aluminum sulfate that actually has been used to precipitate it and form this flocculation with the algae. And then this flocculation will sink down to the bottom. So all that white stuff that you see there, that is the action of the flocculation of the aluminum sulfate bounding with these particles. And not only algae, but it can also bound with bacteria and even molecules, larger molecules. Um, this is a fairly treatment that is being done by the wastewater treatment and water treatment plants. So it, the alum is, is not toxic. It sinks and produces this clarity in about a few days after the treatment, you will notice immediately the effect of this clarification with the alum. So that has been done. And I wanted just to show the magnitude of this particular application. It is huge. And um, that's one alternative. And we'll talk briefly about that. This is another blue-green algae. I have a hard time saying that name, Afanisemanon. Afanisemanon. Gosh, I dare you to. <laughs> it's hard. This particular one creates, and you see this flaky stuff. And you can see the differences by just looking at it in the microscope or just by natural looks. We have some of these and also produce toxins. Oh, I found this again, and credit goes to the website, the Harmful Cyanobacteria Blooms website that is presenting this picture. And this picture was taken from the source of the Kansas Department of Health. And they are presenting a jar test. So they take a sample, they shake it into this jar and then let us settle. And if it settles down to the bottom, that is non microcystis It's another type of blue-green. <laughs> but if it stays in the surface, like floating around, that is microcystis. So there's one way for you to determine at least, at least this, this type of microcystis cases that are present in many places. It could be, well, as a matter of fact, the, the Department of Environmental Protection is having a website where they present these weekly updates. I mean, this is as soon as April 29th, we have evidence on different locations that has been. Also, there has a map of the discharges from Lake Okeechobee and tells you the intensity of the charge. These yellow dots present areas where it has been. There's an area here in Lee County where you see the, the Calusahatchee River mappings of, of aerial satellite pictures satellite pictures where it shows some blooms occurring. And again, the mapping here, if you click on the website, which is down here, you click and it will give you more details about what type of algae, what type of toxins has been detected in those areas. So just to let you know that there are a massive monitoring of blue greens. Other boys that we have as a bad boy, the bad algae, a Botryococcus, Botryococcus, this is not red tie. Red tie is a completely different algae. It's a marine dinoflagellate, Carina brevis. But this guy is Botryococcus is uh, actually floating and produces these oils. And then the red coloration that you see here is mostly oil associated. It's not a toxic algae, but it produces, probably can produce anaerobic conditions. In other words, no oxygen because it doesn't allow the, the diffusion of oxygen into the pond. So that's a bad boy and gas has to be under control if you have a pond like this. Um, this is ugly, but it's not an algae. So <laughs> this is bryozoa. Bryozoa, in fact, let me play this. Bryozoa is actually a colony of these microscopic organisms that you see here on the right side. These are all organisms, sometimes animals, sometimes are protozoa. They are all living in this conglomerate gelatinous blob. And I put this in a uh, stereoscope here to see, of course, this is an insect. This is not the 
bryozoa. This is just an insect that is wandering. I thought it was kind of cute to have it there. This, the white spots here, these are bryozoa. Now, what is the, the meaning of this? Bryozoa being a conglomerate of animals and or organisms are filtering. They're filtering the water. They make the water very clear. So when you have this, it's actually, what is he doing? It's eating. So that's part of his food. So it's part of, again, the whole nature of this. The nature is just feeding somebody. And, yeah, and this is actually a single a microscopic shot. You can see algae associated in that mucilaginous. And this guy is just filtering water and is collecting bacteria, collecting the tiny particles in the water. And that, that's how they, they, they survive and they live. Um, again, here's a close up. Another shot of the, all, all these organisms, the little trumpets doing that. So this is an indication of a good pond, a good ecosystem. These organisms are able to live there. And, but the, these blobs of algae, of um, um, conglomerates, blobs are floating sometimes that can cover up the surface of the water. And, uh, but when you have it, just to know that this is not an algae and we don't control this. Um, now, I have some other um, considerations here. There is a problem with this type of plant. It's called Ballacinaria americana, better known as tape grass. Sometimes it grows in ponds, Cape Coral uh, canals. So, the, but the pond, I mean, the, the plant is an excellent removing nutrients out of the water, making the water very clear, but it has a problem that detaches from, this, from the bottom. And if the leaves float up in the surface, this leaf are gonna be causing some attachment to some other type of plants like filamentous algae. And filamentous algae will be associated with the leaf that are floating. Now, what causes those leaf to float? Sometimes herbivores like snails, like the grass carp, some other herbivores will detach or just the leaf will detach by itself, forming these mats and those mats will be covering with the filamentous algae. I wanted to give you a nice close up here of the filamentous algae in case that you don't see filamentous algae that close. Anyway. Now, solutions for that particular case with Ballacinaria take grass. We had done some studies in Cape Coral, we put a little barrier here. This barrier was placed and we did an application of something called Ponzilla. Ponzilla is a bacteria enzyme. These enzymes will break down the cellulose of the tissue of the floating leaf of the Ballacinaria. And along with the chelated copper, which chelated copper, it's a formulation of copper that is not copper sulfate. This chelated copper is more effective and it will attach and it will break down the cellulose of this plant and then making the whole plant sink. The leaf will sink in about a couple of days, two days, two, three days, and you disappear from that area that we're treated and leaving the outside as a control. And this area definitely was treated. Now, what happened to that leaf? It sinks to the bottom and there will be some other organisms who will start taking the nutrients out of that bacteria, fungus, internal muck that it will be definitely breaking down that. And that's where the transformation from the nutrients in the leaf, it will go into some other organisms. And I tell you that because I have done the water quality analysis of this water here. And it's not like, oh, it went nutrients were skyrocket. No, something else took those nutrients away from this plant that it was floating. Um, we'll talk about that and we'll leave some questions uh, open for at the end. Um, other issues like on other solutions, microcystis has been treated, like I said before, with alum and also chelated copper has been used to treat that. I have a, present, um, a little test jar here where we put the control has not been treated with anything. We have here alum at 100 ppm and then 10. And this is the one in combination with another mineral it's called phoslock. And this phoslock has the ability to capture and um, sequester phosphorus, which is the best combination. Phoslock and alum did the best job in there. Now, phoslock is a little expensive, but nevertheless, does a good job. 
Um, so Kara, my favorite one, it's um, another one that it can be controlled easily with chemical control, mechanical control. You can rake this very easy with a rake. There's not a trouble with this one. Or you can use biological control with the triploid grass carp. And here's my triploid grass carp. This is, um, this is a tool that has been used a lot. And this fish loves this, this plant. So you can, but you have to determine how many fish per vegetated acre. You don't want to put too many fish because then you shift from this nice, beautiful, clear pond with the fish and you can see to a planktonic algae and you don't want that. So you want to keep a little bit of the transparency with the cara present there and the fish and then by having a certain amount. So you use the fish to suppress the weeds, but not to eliminate the weeds because the weeds has to be there to present in order to absorb and remove some of the nutrients to make the water clear and to provide habitat for other fish like the bluegills and the bass and some other organisms that are also live there. Now, in conclusion, boy, did I went fast. I hope I'm not. <laughs> we'll leave a lot of questions and answers. But in conclusion, something is green is going to grow in your pond, whether it's planktonic algae, filamentous algae, or submerged vegetation. So be aware of that. Nature is going to grow something green. Knowing where the nutrients are coming from helps to control the algae, whether it's the fertilizer runoff, or whether it's internal cycling from the muck in the bottom. All this information will help you understand where your problem is coming from. Having littoral plants to disguise the presence of some filamentous algae is beneficial, not only for nutrient removal, but also for erosion control. And we talked about this in previous meetings, presentations, webinars. Erosion control with littoral plants is massive. And the last, last thing is, the, and the wildlife will appreciate that immensely. So many animals are gonna get associated, not only the fish, but gambusia fish, and also the birds who love to live in these littoral plants. And then finally, and this is the toughest one, educate the community that having some algae is not bad. Now that's a very hard pill to swallow because no plants, but let me show you something here just to get to that point. This video is showing littoral plants and you see the beautiful green and all these plants are going in there. Again, controlling erosion, having habitat. And you might see now a little bit of that filamentous algae, all oh, that scum. Hey, but that scum is the one that makes the water clear. And again, you can have it associated or not, but you get, you're gonna have it no matter what. But then most people pay attention on the plants and the flowers, but not the scum, not the, yeah, not the scum. But the scum is the one who's doing the job there. One more picture, the last one. This is a typical pond in Southwest Florida, with no littoral plants, but you have the scum there. And the scum is there because why? Because you can see it. Now, if you have all this area here covered with littoral plants, you have a better balanced ecosystem you have the disguising of that scum and you still will have the protection from the shoreline as erosion. The, 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 the ultimate message here is just to keep an ecosystem well balanced because a well balanced ecosystem will be able to support some of these inputs because we're always going to have some nutrients coming out of the runways and the roads and the roof, nitrogen and phosphorus deposition. You're always going to have that. So the pond if you have it well balanced, it will be able to absorb some of this stuff and then keep a, a nice system. So not so troublesome. And that's my last slide. And now I'll be happy to open. In fact, if I have Karen <laughs> to, if Karen is able to take over, I would love to have Karen controlling the, the podium. I'm back. I'm Yay. back. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, our, our power went out. Oh. So that that was fun. <laughs> but anyways, we're we're gonna open it up to questions and people can unmute and ask their question. Yes. Or you can put your, your question into the chat. Karen Craig Hankins asked in the chat, 
um, he said, can you provide a link for the algae ID pictures? Yes, in fact, the website, we will, re we're recording this, so it will be there, but I can put the PowerPoint, um, you know, just the links, yeah, making it in a text, so you can have an access to all those links. Thank you, Craig. You know what, Marlene, I don't know that I'm seeing the questions in the chat. So if there's others, just jump in. Is there anyone who wants to unmute and ask a question? Awesome, awesome presenter, thank you. Ernesto, um, yes. we have not had a lot of success planting the littorals. Last year and the year before, we planted them right before the rains came and then there were tremendous winds and a lot of them just floated away. Mm -hmm. So our lake company said that we should be waiting to plant them this year when the water is high, which I find sort of strange because how do you plant them if the water is high? Yeah, yeah. the soil <laughs> will be as, as conducted to the root system to be attached. I have a suspicion because this happened also in another community that they didn't know that why the plants are being removed. Grass carp might be present in your pond. If it is, grass carp will be pulling those plants and they start nibbling on that. So one thing that we advise is to put a barrier, to put a, a, a like a fence barrier in, in front of that to allow the cluster of uh, littorals to really consolidate. And once you have a, the cluster very well established, then the barrier can be removed, but they have to be very well. And then the other thing is the grass carp should not be put in extremely high numbers because they get hungry. And they have nothing else. They're not going to filter the algae. So they're going to go on for the grass. <laughs> and then these littorals are part of that. Ernesto, I have one so more question. That beautiful grass behind you, is that grass in, the, I don't know if you can see what's behind you. <laughs> well, that pond that we have as a, as a frame is actually, um, is they're all littorals. And I could probably see that there's some spike rush and maybe some larger plants. I can send you pictures of different types. In fact, I should put a PowerPoint presentation with good littorals and good examples of littorals so you can get an idea of what to do in the ponds. Thank you. And that's been on my list of things to do also um, is to get pictures like that and get them on the website. Um, Great. Mr. or Ms. Van Gelder says, do you find that infiltration trenches around the upland perimeter of stormwater ponds may limit the fertilizer ap applied to the edge of the pond as well as capturing nutrient runoff? That's a big question. As, back, is, as a matter of fact, there's some techniques that the developers finally are getting smart about that to build like a berm before the pond. So you have you have an area that is where the grass is going to be, and then they have a, a little tiny sump in there, and then it has a higher elevation, and then it comes in the, the, the pond, the slope for the pond. But in that indentation is where most of the trapping will occur from the runoff, from the roads, and also from the roof, and it being trapping into that area. And that's where the grass, the regular Florida tam, or San Agustin or whatever kind of grass you have. It will, that, that's the best scenario. But when you don't have that hump, then you're just gonna be running into it. And sadly, Sa Florida does not have a good soil bottom. So it's all sandy soil. So it will percolate down to the, through the grass into the soil that is sandy and it goes right into the pond. That, that's the nature of Southwest Florida. So the takeaway there is slowing down the rainwater or holding the rainwater? Holding the rainwater or dissipate it before it goes into the pond. Um, they, they, what do you call those things? The spout, the spout, now they're building it, we have diffusers or a pipe 
that can actually diffuse the water before it goes into the pond. So sending the water straight, although some, and this is part of the engineering thing, some already are putting some pipe that goes right into the pond. It doesn't go into the grass because there's eroding underneath the grass, the Bermuda grass or the Florida Tam is making a, a erosion underneath there. And then Robert Niebauer uh, so, makes the comment. So the message to our HOA members is that they should not feel that all algae is bad. Absolutely, yes. And that's a hard one to present. And, it's, and I, I know I brought it, that was my last conclusion comment is like to educate is, is one of the things. And I, one way I, I think we can is by presenting pictures and all of a sudden showing, oh, but look at there, there is a filamentous algae right underneath all that littorals. So leave the littorals and leave the filamentous algae. It's, it's not bad. And Camila Perez uh, says, and, and pa pasted a link into the chat box, that the Naples Botanical Garden will be teaching a littoral presentation at this workshop. And she provides a link there. Um, we can probably put that on our wet plan Facebook page. And I know I can put it on the uh, Cocoloba chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society's Facebook page. I love it. Um, and Mr. and Ms. Van Gelder uh, makes the comment, also would deter fertilizer from being applied right to the pond edge, allows for other landscaping that may, be, that may not be as nutrient dependent and provides diversity. And I think that's regarding that little berm or that little dip prior to the edge of the pond. Correct, correct. Oh, it's, it's, it's a battle and in fact, a lot of them. I understand that you have to fertilize sometimes because the green, the grass gets yellow and things. Uh, but then outside of that window blackout, it's okay. Nevertheless, there still be some effect. But I, I tell you, I, I gotta admit that sometimes, if you have a well balanced pond, the pond will be able to absorb that and then be able to do what it's supposed to do. The, the problem is when you don't have a nice setup pond because your expectation is different than the expectation of the, what nature is intended to do. Karen Barker, did you have a question? Did you want to unmute? Yeah. Hi, Ernesto. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, hey, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, they've been putting like some lake dye in our lake and it seems to be it seems to do really well in, in you know, preventing the growth of algae and everything. Is there any negative to that? It doesn't hurt the lake at all, does it? Or does it? No, it does not. In fact, the dyes have been phenomenal, always being used. Now, the only thing is it looks a little bit artificial because that blue is, is not natural. Uh, some companies are selling now black dye, which is yeah. a little bit better because I think, okay, you don't see that that artificial blue and it's just dark and you think it might be tannins or something in the line but it is beneficial you in, in uh, like a suppressed it not a light that goes to the bottom because you will have plants growing when you have plenty light and in, in the case of most, most ponds when you have a water that is so crystal clear the penetration of our light will yeah, the attenuation of light will impede the, the growth of some of the submerged. And you, if you have previously hydrilla or um, or some nias or some other water plants, yeah, they will be suppressed by the having less light. Okay. Oh, I have, I have another question. Um, I can, I, you know, I can send a link to wet plan, but quite honestly, a lot of the people here, no, they're not going to watch it. Is there something you can have like a, a file? you could send me that just had, you know, those points about not all algae was bad and everything, you know, like a couple sheets that I could just uh, uh, send out in an email, you know, it's not real huge or something like that because that they would probably look at. You know, in the, in the, in the old days, when we used to have meetings before COVID, remember those days, we used mm -hmm. to go to the communities and I would love to be presenting this and then have a little conversation. So especially with people who do not like that idea, 
and then not to trying to convince them, but trying to show them the other side of the of the equation, because it, it does make a difference when you look at the videos and pictures on, and, and, and examples of other places where they ha don't have that kind of issue. So we'll be probably basing, moving into that kind of uh, activities soon, as I'm hoping. Okay, thank you. And um, just kind of backtracking a little bit, we did have Chad Washburn from Naples Botanical Garden who presented on plants at the end of last year, I believe. And he did a nice presentation and, and made some suggestions about littoral plantings, including, I remember mixing the two species of Eleocharis. Yeah. He liked to see mixed. And there were some preferences he had that were, um, strictly personal preferences um, about plants that he recommended or plants that he didn't recommend. And that is available on the wetplan.org website. Talking about different um, ponds, that might be a nice segue to Karen. I don't know, Karen, if you can jump back in um, and to can, yes. talk potentially about the contest. Yes. Or competition? I will. Let me pull up. Let me pull up uh, my slides. Did anyone Good. have any other quick questions before we talk about the exciting competition in Lee County? Oh, you know what, Marlene? I cannot share my screen. So it uh, says I'm not in control. All right. How about if we make you? Uh, okay. I had to make you. No, I can't. I don't have that yeah, ability I... to, to make you a host. Because I'm not a host. <laughs> but we can barely, barely, barely. <laughs> All right, there we go. Now I can. That was so weird. I'll I share my screen. Before. Oh, fantastic. I know you did. And somehow it went away. But so can you see my screen now? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, we can see. Okay, great. So we wanted you to know that coming soon we're gonna we're gonna have a pond contest. And it's going to be for both great ponds. And if you feel like your pond might need a mini makeover or some help, there'll be a, a contest for that as well. So watch the um wet plan website for some more information about that. And that will be coming up. Um, June 1st. And with that. Uh, June 1st? June 1st, it will be open for, for participants. June 1st. And that will be okay, an online great. application, correct? Yes, they go to www.wetplan.org and they will see it there. And they can fit all the rules and apply for it. And yeah, it, it, it will be on our website. There you go. There, there's the website there on this um, slide. And if you have questions, we also have an email address there. So you can always send your questions to wet, wetplaninfo at gmail.com. So that's our contact information. I don't know if there's any other questions. We still have. Just a couple minutes if there are. If not, this presentation we can was end recorded early. and will be available also on the wet plan along with the prior presentations. Uh, make an announcement yeah. for next meeting, uh, next, next presentation. So the next presentation, which are our wet plan pond side talks are always the first Wednesday of the month at 11 o'clock. And uh, I will actually be talking at the next pond side talk about um, our fertilizer ordinance and best management practices for yard and, uh, and pond maintenance. So any closing words, Ernesto? No, no, I just want to thank everybody for being participant and to 
to spread the word around that, <laughs> that there's not good, um, there's no bad algae, it's just out of control. <laughs> <laughs> so LG is your is not your enemy. That's what we want to say, right? Yeah. <laughs> so great. Well, send us any questions you have, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, thank Vanessa. you. Thank thanks. you very much, Karen. Everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. I'll stop recording. Yeah, could you please? I can't. Yeah, I actually, yes.